So this morning, we get to hear from one of my favorite preachers. I love it. So, uh, yeah, the other day we were, um, we were pr- praying together. We were uh, just seeking the Lord together. And, you know, the Lord was um, talking to us about some other stuff. I don't remember. But I looked over at Amy, and she looked like she was bubbling over, like she had a word. I could just see it. She just had a word bubbling out of her heart. And uh, I just looked at her, and I thought, she's supposed to preach this week. So I don't ever put that much pressure on. I just said, I go, hey, I'll grab you. So we finish praying, we go in the prayer room, and I go, hey, uh, hey, I'm going to preach four times in the next two weeks. You want one of them? She goes, what? I said, yeah, why don't you take one of them? Or, you know, pray about it, see if you want to. And no pressure, but if you want to, let me know. And then we were together in another meeting like two days later. She goes, I need to talk to you. I go, okay. And, and And she said, I think I want to preach on Sunday. And I said, I think I want you to preach on Sunday. And I said, I go, which one do you feel like, which one do you want? She goes, I I think I'm supposed to preach at the 11. I go, I do too. So you get to hear one of my favorite preachers this morning. I want to pray for you, okay? Lord, we love you. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the gift of God. And we receive the gift of God through Amy right now. We open our hearts to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church. So, Lord, I thank you. Anoint her to speak your word. Anoint her to share the heart of the Father and the heart of the Son. Holy Spirit, right now, increase your presence. And, Father, I thank you that her tongue is as the pen of a ready writer. And, Lord, we're going to receive. Let her speak as an oracle right now. We give you thanks. In the name of Jesus, everybody said amen. Amen, amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Billy. Yeah, that's true. When he asked me, would you like to, would you like to speak this Sunday? I just kind of gave him this kind of deer in headlights look. And I thought, well, let me go home and think about this and pray about it and see what the Lord, the Lord might say. And I'm just, I'm learning like all of you are learning. We're all in process because When he asked me, I waited a second to see if the Lord would give me anything. And I didn't really feel anything specific. And so I went home and I prayed about it and I talked to Jeff and Alicia and one other person. And then I thought in my mind, yes, I'm going to do this. I'm going to say yes. And then the Lord just started downloading what he wanted me to say. And see, we like for it to be the other way around, or I do. Like, you give me this awesome message, and then I'll go tell him I have something to say. But the Lord told me, I didn't ask you to say yes to a message. I asked you to say yes to a calling. And what you said a couple of months ago is that you would say yes to the next thing. And that was the next thing. And I just have to say in front of everyone that, as Dustin said earlier, we are a family. I'm so grateful for for all of you. I'm so grateful for our pastoral leadership team. I come under their authority this morning. I come under their protection. The... um, a little bit of discouragement tried to find me last night. We, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. But within 30 minutes, I had heard from all of our pastoral leadership team encouraging me, praying for me. And I am so grateful that we get to serve under men who are for women and for us answering yes to the call of the Lord. It is such a blessing. It was funny, I had asked Billy, um, I said, do you think that you could um, maybe like go up with me at the very beginning? And um, I said, I'm not very good at this. I'm new to this. And I remembered when I was younger and I would go snow skiing with one of my cousins that I would go and my uncle always had to like help me off the lift. I didn't really know how to get going. But once I would start going, I was really good, but I never learned how to stop. I I just, I never understood how you like angled the skis in and like slowed down. And so what I learned to do was sit down and I feel like this a little bit up here. 
<laughs> but I don't know exactly how to get started. And then I get going and, the, and I say, thus saith the Lord. And then when I'm done, I'm like out. I'm like tap out. I don't know. Billy, come up here, handle the rest of it. To God be the glory. So that may be what happens. I have my stool. If you see me sit down, I'm done. <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> So as I was asking the Lord, what do you want me to talk about? And he keeps bringing us back to this word family. And you know, who we are in a family is more about who we are than what we do. And he kept bringing this word identity to mind. Do we know who we are? You can turn to Genesis 25 if you have your Bibles, and that's where I'll be reading from today. But identity, knowing who we are, is of utmost importance for us to hear what it is that we're supposed to do. You know, Jesus is preparing his bride, and he wants us to know who we are. For those of us who, um, for those of us girls who've gotten married, we know what it's like to go to the courthouse and have to apply for new documents, and we need new social security numbers because we are changing our name. And, you know, before you can change your name legally, you have to go and show proof of who you have been before you can come become who you're meant to be. And you also are giving these documents as a sign to these people and to your husband that I am laying down who I was so that I can lay a hold of who I am and who I'm going to be. Because Amy Samples was a daughter in the family. Okay? Amy Lyle was going to become a wife. That looks very different in the home. It's two very different positions. And we have to be willing to admit who we were and acknowledge to lay it down so that we can become who God is calling us to be. And so I believe this morning that God has some new names for all of us, that he has an inheritance that he wants to give to us, But that inheritance has our new name on it. Okay, so for us to lay a hold of this, we're going to have to say our new name. Okay, so we're going to talk about Jacob because he knows all too well what it's like to to say one name and God make you another one. So in uh, Genesis 25, verses 21, says, And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. So what we find is this lady is pregnant, and she feels a battle literally going on in her womb. And she goes and asks the only person who has an answer for her, which is the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger, which was very uncommon, completely uncommon, especially in that day. There were certain rights to the firstborn male in a family. Verse 24 says, when her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak, so they called his name Esau. Afterwards, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. And so we see that before these two boys are even born, the sibling rivalry is already taking place. They are already warring. And even in labor and delivery, Jacob says is holding Esau's heel. Like, you might be first, but I'm coming right behind you. And so they named the first one Esau, and they named the second one Jacob. 
and it says that Isaac was 60 years old when she, when she bore them. I thought it was interesting. The Lord just kind of highlighted this to me, and I'm, I'm not going to stay here. But I thought it was interesting that Rebecca named him Jacob, which is what she saw in the natural. Okay, Jacob means conniving. It means to assail. To, it means to circumvent. But she had actually received a promise about that boy, and she did not call him according to that promise. She called him and named him what she saw with her natural eyes, and then he followed into that. Okay, so the Lord's going to talk to us about what we see in each other and how we say each other's names. And we're to move beyond what we see in the natural and call each other by what God says that they are. We're going to talk about that this morning. So then these boys, oh, well, let me read verse 27 too. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. So now to add insult to injury, not only are these boys rivaling, but now the parents have a favorite, which is always a bad idea. That's like a completely different message all on its own. But we cannot have favorites in our family. Okay, it's not good for the parents, it's not good for the one being favored, and it's definitely not good for the one who feels less than. So when they become teenagers, uh, many years, the scripture doesn't cover what their childhood looks like. Um, Jacob is living and he is being true to his name. And so Esau comes in from the field and is starving and weary, and Jacob is there with some stew and Esau asked his brother for some of his food. And Jacob, being true to his name, agrees only to give him some if he will sell him, give him his birthright. And so Jacob, just instead of sharing with his brother, instead of just blessing his brother, uses uh, Esau's hunger to benefit himself. While I was reading that, I thought, who in the world would like sell their birthright for a pot of stew? I thought it was so interesting. And it says that even Esau says, well, what is the use of my birthright? I'm going to die anyway. And I kind of laughed because I thought, dude, you are standing there talking to your brother. Like, clearly you're not about to die. But then I kind of had to laugh because I thought, well, I kind of get that way when I'm hungry too. Like when we leave here on Sundays, I tell Jeff, I'm like, I am starving to death. And I'm clearly not. I'm hangry is probably what it is. <laughs> and Esau was too. He came in hangry. Jacob saw it, and he took advantage of his weakness. Let's move on. So Genesis 27. So now um, Jacob has stolen the birthright. The sibling rivalry continues. When I, it says um, in Genesis 27, it says, When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son, and he answered, Here I am. He said, Behold, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now then, take your weapons, your quiver, and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me, and prepare for me delicious food such as I love, and bring it to me so that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. So Isaac is older now. He is sensing that he may not be around very much longer. He tells Esau, I want you to go. I want you to hunt. I want you to get me some food. I want you to bring it to me. I'm going to eat of it, and I'm going to bless you. So Rebecca, the mom, hears this conversation, and she does not want that to happen. So she calls Jacob her favorite to her and she says you bring me two of our goats and I will prepare this food and you can take it in to your dad pretending to be Esau and Jacob says well what if he what if he wants to to fill me Esau is hairy I'm smooth and so they put one of Esau's cloaks so that when Isaac is uh, calls him to him he will not be able to tell which son he is talking to so that Jacob can still that blessing and that is exactly what happens 
So Isaac calls him in and he asks him, who are you? And Jacob says, I am Esau. He is acting in his real name, which is to be deceiving. But he says, I'm actually the older brother. I am deserving of this. I am the one that is supposed to inherit this blessing. And so Isaac blesses him. Right after that, Esau gets home. He understands what's happened, and he says, I am going to kill my brother. I'm going to wait until my dad dies. But when my dad dies, I am going to kill my brother for stealing this blessing. So Jacob has to flee his home. And on his way to Laban's house, on the way to this new land, God gives him a dream. And I just had to stop and think about that for a second because I realized that right after his failure, God still shows up and encounters him. And doesn't he do that with us too? He had just royally messed up. He has not made it right, and God still comes and visits him in a dream. And I just jotted this down while I was reading that this week. I said, some of us need to be reminded that God could actually be more pleased with the latest mistake we made that humbled us more than the last accomplishments that called us, caused us to be arrogant. So God is not intimidated by your mistakes, and he is not intimidated by your sin. He had a calling on Jacob's life, and he was going to get it one way or the other. And unfortunately, Jacob, like some of us, he chose the hard way. And so Jacob ends up in Laban's land. Y'all know the story. I'll say it very quickly, just in case there's a newbie here that doesn't know, and that's okay. He sees Laban's daughter, Rachel. He falls in love with her. The Bible says she's beautiful. He wants to marry her. He asks Laban, what do I have to do to marry this girl? And Laban says, I want you to work for me seven years. And Jacob, Jacob agrees to it. So seven years, there is a wedding. Jacob wakes up the next morning and recognizes that Laban, his new father-in-law, has tricked him, and he has actually given him the other sister, Leah, who Jacob did not love, and the Bible does not say anything about her being beautiful. In fact, it says that she has weak eyes. So Jacob, who the last we hear giving his name is pretending to be his brother, is now married to a girl who pretended to be her sister. Okay, so Jacob invites this deception into his life when he pretends to be Esau with, with his dad. So he has invited deception to be in and around him. And so the deceiver becomes deceived. Let's go. <laughs> and so... So then Jacob goes back to Laban and says, I really love Rachel. What do I have to do to marry Rachel, who I actually, this is actually the sister I love. And Laban says, you're going to have to work another seven years for me, and then I will give you Rachel. So he has Leah. He doesn't love her. He wants to marry Rachel, and he agrees to work 14 years for this girl. I mean, he must really, really love her. I mean, I don't know, babe. I don't know if in 1997, Danny Samples had said, you're going to have to work 14 years for this girl. He's saying yes. <laughs> He's giving me a thumbs up, also with a look of like, please don't have this conversation while you're on the platform. <laughs> I'm just going to believe that you would have done it. But Jacob, things are not, like, not wonderful for him. Okay, so, but he finally gets Rachel. See, God was already teaching this impulsive man how to wait. Because that's not really in his character, if you think about it. He wants things instantly. And he wants it by deception. But this woman that he falls in love with changes his mind and he says, you know what, I, th I think I can wait on something that I really, really want. 
And so he didn't see it, but God was already beginning to work in this man's life. And so he, he ends up, he has Rachel and Leah. The Lord is blessing him. Jacob has received a dream. He's been blessed by his natural father. Even though it was deceitful, he still received that blessing. He was still blessed. He is married to Leah and Rachel. He has children. He is prospering. His animals are healthy. And then you will not believe what God tells him to do next. And it must have been a shock to hear. In Genesis 31.3, it says, Then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers and to your kindred. You know he thought, you, you have got to be kidding me. I, I am here. I am making a home for myself. I have children. There is a bounty on my head in my homeland, and you want me to go back. When I'm praying and the Lord says something like that, I say, come again? I'm assuming Jacob said, you, really? That's exactly what God wanted him to do. He knows Esau wants to kill him, and God wants him to go back. So, let's go a little further. further. Jacob, this is where I really want to get to. He has a wrestling match with God himself. So he obeys the word of the Lord, and he decides, I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back to my homeland. This is what the Lord wants me to do. So he gets his, his wives, his children, his animals, and he sets out to go back. And I can only imagine the fear that he was feeling in his heart. And now knowing that not only did my poor choice has, could end up me losing my life, but now I have my wives and my children to think about as well. I've put them in this not-so-wonderful situation and so he decides to lay down, and it says in verse 24, it says, the same night he arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He sent them across the stream and everything else that he had, and in verse 24, it says, and Jacob was left alone. You know, sometimes when God wants to really deal with us about something, he'll let us get alone. He'll position us in a place where his is the only voice that we're going to hear. And sometimes we think that we've done something wrong or, wow, these people have abandoned me. And really, it's God just getting us into a place where he can speak with us so that we will hear him. You know, we were on vacation um, a little over a week ago, and I love vacation. I love being with my family. I love seeing different things and eating different food, and I, t I take it all in. I love it. But my family knows that when we are on our way home after those five or six days away, that I am chomping at the bit to get back into my den and get my family out of the house for a little while so that I can be with the Lord. I love it. I know where my strength comes from. I am nothing without him. Nothing. And I'm good with it. And so we are right, winding down this mountain, and we are coming home, and I'm just, I'm looking at the sky, and I'm thinking, I cannot wait to get with the Lord, and I can't wait to get my den, and I'm going to turn my worship music on loud, and I'm going to pray, and I'm going to read. And I like to do this for like several hours. And thankfully, I have a life that, that enables me to do that. So we get home, and I recognize that we have people working in our house right now. And if you're here or you're watching, I'm so thankful for your work. But I really am. But that Monday morning, I got, I got up, and I thought, oh, man, we're, I'm going to have people, like, in and out of my house, and the door's going to be opening, and I need to be with the Lord. 
Like, it is his voice that I need to hear. I just had, the night before, sent my son off to, with FM camp, and I'm not going to see him for 10 days, and he's never been gone that long, and I know who I need to hear from. I need to hear from the Lord. I need to hear from God. And so Monday morning comes, and sure enough, these awesome workers show up to do their awesome work that I'm very grateful for. And I was so disappointed. I thought, what in the world am I going to do? And so thankful, thankfully, we have friends that are in this community that live just several houses down the road. And so I called them. <laughs> and um, I actually texted. I prefer texting. And I said, um, I was like, good morning. We're back from vacation. And we're kind of talking back. She's like, well, great. And I was like, what are y'all doing today? She's like, oh, we're just kind of around the house. And I was like, good. And she was like, well, did you want to stop by? Did you want to pop over? And I was like, yeah. It's this true story. And I said, and I don't really know how to ask this, but I was wondering that, like, when I get over there to pop in, if y'all could leave. <laughs> And them, knowing me very well, said, absolutely, the house is yours. <laughs> I'm like telling it, I'm like, I really did that. Oh, well. So I got over to their house, and they were gracious enough that they had already left. And I went in that house, and I turned my music on, <laughs> and I started talking to the Lord. And within minutes, I feel my strength coming back. I feel my joy coming back. I know who I am when I am looking at the Lord because he calls me by my true name. And thankfully, I have awesome friends who allowed me a little bit of time at their house every day last week by myself. I spent some time with them too, but I also spent some time by myself. And I needed it. So Jacob was left alone. He's certain, no doubt, that they will all be killed, and he is left alone. His mind had to have been running. And it says that a man comes and wrestles with him all night long. If you've ever been up with a child, or you've ever been up sick, if you're up all night long, it feels really, really long. Really, really long. And of course, we know that this, who he's wrestling with, is actually the Lord. So he is wrestling, and he is wrestling. God, you know, God does some interesting things with us. Because if, if I thought that one of my loved ones, one of my precious ones, was going to get up the next morning and have this incredible battle ahead of them the next day, I would make sure that they, like, had a good dinner and had a good night's rest and, you know, that they had a comfy blanket to lay on. And, and God knows this. He knows what's coming, and he actually chooses to show up and wrestle him. Doesn't it sound like the Lord, though? And it says they wrestled all night long, and the, when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob... He touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. It's God that he's wrestling with, and he breaks him. He breaks him. And then he says, let me go. For the day has broken, but Jacob says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to Jacob, what is your name? He is there. He is with God himself. And by the way, when God asks a question, it is not because he does not know the answer. He always knows the answer. He wants to hear us say it. And he says, my name is Jacob. 
my name is Jacob. You see, God has had for Jacob, has for us promises, dreams, inheritances. He has all these things for us, but before we can lay a hold of them, some of us have gotten stuck in something that happened in our past. Maybe it was something that we did. Maybe it was something that was done to us. I don't know, but when we think about ourselves and our identity, that's who we actually picture. And God can only heal something that we will offer to him. And we only offer it after we've acknowledged it ourselves. Traumas, abuse, sins, failures. If we are constantly trying to cover them up, that's not something that God can come in and use in us yet. He wants us to take our masks off and just say exactly who we are and who we have been. The good, bad, and the ugly. God can take it. I had this picture of a door when I was uh, thinking about this message. And it's a door with a room on the other side. And on the other side is a new name, our true identity, our inheritance, our promises, prophetic words that have been spoken over our lives. And some of us don't feel connected to them. And the reason is there's this uh, security thing on on the door. And for us to get through it, we have to say our new name. We have to say our new name. And so as soon as he says, my name is Jacob, the angel says, your your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men, and you have prevailed. And see, the enemy wants us to think that if we go back and we visit this hurt, this harm, this sin, that we will stay there, that we will start despairing. But if we will go back there one more time at God's invitation, it is immediate. You say it and he says, no, it's not. That's not who you are anymore. It is an immediate release of everything that we have been. And Jacob was already changing, but he didn't know it. It took the struggle for him to know who he was, okay? And so what I see is that it's like an orange. If you squeeze that orange, orange juice will start coming out. Some of us have, we are already changing, but we are still going by our old name. And it is the pressure that God puts on us that will cause us to identify, I am not the same as who I was. I did not just handle that the way I would have a year ago. I have a new name. We have new names. The enemy wants to keep you in that. You see, he showed up at that, at, at that wrestling match, Jacob did, and he wrestled with him all night, which showed that he could but he was still going by his old name. Why? Because the trial is what presented the opportunity for Jacob to know he had changed. And that's not who he was anymore. It is the struggle that lets us know who we are. I have said before, it is not a trial. We'll we'll say something happened and this person fell away. No, a trial reveals who you already were becoming. A trial will not make or break you. It will show the strength you already had inside and God knew it, but he wants you to know it. He wants you to know that you are strong and that you are valuable and you are not the old name that you're carrying around with you anymore. Oh, the Lord is so good. You know, it's interesting. He asked God his name. Vulnerability, identity will bring enlightenment to us. 
Because in the end, God actually doesn't even ask his question, but Jacob names that place, I have seen God face to face. And what he showed me is when we're in this name that we, God has given us a new name, but we still feel regret over our old name, and we're kind of going by it, we're kind of going by this new one, it's like wearing a mask. If you've ever been to like a masquerade party and everybody's wearing a mask, because God wants us to be real. He wants to, us to be authentic. We are family. But if you get around, if you walk into a masquerade ball and everybody has on a mask, you know what the first thing you're going to want to do is, is to put on a mask yourself. Because hiddenness invites hiddenness. But identity invites identity. I want to be a real girl. God has helped me to be a real girl. When people don't want to be real, they don't like to be friends with me. Because I want to go, I want to go deep with someone. That's who I am. I like doing things side by side, but I'd much rather do it face to face because I want to know who you are. I want to see the gold that God has put in you so that I can help call it out. And we need some realness. And what we don't understand is when we are not walking in our true identity, we put that mask on. And what we don't understand is, yes, we are hidden, but it also distorts how we see out those little bitty eyes. Because we perceive things with all of our senses, with all of our senses. And so when we have that mask on, we're hidden, but we cannot, he could not even see God for who he was. When we are walking in our old identity and God shows up to wrestle with us, we'll think he's there to harm us because our vision is, is hidden behind this mask that we're trying to hide behind. When he took that mask off and accepted his new name, he said, I have seen God face to face. We cannot see each other the way that God has made us if we are wearing a mask of hiddenness because it distorts our vision. It distorts our vision. It distorts how we see things and how we see people. And they will look like threats instead of sisters. And they will look like competition instead of brothers. So we need our new names. We need our new names. God has some new names for us this morning. Thank you. So the Lord in this struggle, he allows Jacob for the first time to receive a blessing that he didn't have to cheat for. God allows him to do that. How good of God, because you see up until that point, if you asked Jacob about any of his accomplishments, he would have had to told you that he, that he cheated for it and that he lied for it. And what I have found, anything that we have to lie and cheat to get, we never feel secure in having it, ever. It can be a person, it can be a ministry, it can be a job, but if you have to lie and be deceptive and manipulate to get it, you will never be secure in having it. That is good. I'm cracking myself up here. here. <laughs> but when we allow God to bring us something, quit laughing, Billy. <laughs> I, I cry when other people cry, and I laugh when other people laugh, even if I don't know the story or what's going on. I just do. <laughs> so, so the Lord allows Jacob to have this opportunity, like, I have a blessing for you, and I am going to let you receive it in the most authentic way, in a way that you can feel good about, and know that it resembles the new name I have given you. Not only that, who I see what time it is. Okay, so... <laughs> I love y'all. 
Y'all are awesome. So Jacob has received his new name. He's in this struggle. And by the way, I do want to say this. Some of us are still li- living in Laban's land. We're still living in this, in this old name. Even though God's giving us promises, we're still living there because it's comfortable and we don't want to go back and face this hurt and who we were and admit it. And God's not upset. He's inviting you to leave there. He's inviting you to leave there this morning. Some of us are actually in the middle of this fight. We decided to acknowledge it. We have left. We are, we are going back home. And God has showed up and beginning is beginning to put the pressure on us for our good. But we have asked him to stop. Because you see, the angel almost left. He almost did. And God is inviting us to get back in this fight and get back in this pressure that he can show us what he already knows is inside. But some of us, as soon as the pressure hits and as soon as the difficulty, we bow out. And that's where we are in this story. And what a very different story it would have been if it had ended there. But Jacob says, he gets ready to leave and Jacob says, don't go. I am not going to allow you to go until you bless me. That shows you where his mindset was because this is the same man who has been hurting him all night and when he gets ready to leave, Jacob says no. And you know why? Because he did for Jacob what he's done for me and what he's done for so many of you. God is so wise, which is like the understatement of the year, but anyway, he is so wise that he shows up and he gives us a taste of dreams and prophetic words and a taste of our inheritance. Why? Because we will get through the pain to get there. That's usually how he will work. He will give us a taste of what we could possibly get a hold of, and then there's a stop. He did it with Abraham. He did it with David, and he's done it with Jacob. He's done it with me, that he'll give you this word, which we would all prefer to come like tomorrow, and it never does. But he gives us a taste of this incredible inheritance, this incredible dream that he has for us, and then he stops it with a process of transforming us. We start becoming the person that can actually take hold of these dreams. And so why do I think that Jacob was, was willing to keep going through? Because he knew what was on the other side. That's why I can take this pain. I can take this struggle because God has shown me what's on the other side and it is worth it. Something had become more important than his pain in that moment. And it's interesting to me too that Jacob did not ask him to stay and heal him. He asked him to stay and bless him because God had broken him. And when God has broken you, you know it. And just like Jacob, you walk different. You walk different the rest of your life. If you, if you sit there and think, have I been broken by God? Then you have not. Because when you have been broken by God, you know the day, you know the hour, you know the minute, and you know that you don't walk the same anymore. And you know that you will never walk the same. Because before Earlier in my 20s, I knew that I needed to spend time with the Lord, but I didn't rush to other people's houses and kick them out so that I could be with God. Why? Because I could go a couple of days, I could even go a week without talking to God. And you know what he showed me? That if you can go a day or a week without talking to God, you are living a life that you can do without him. And if you are living a life that you can do without him, you are not living the life that God has for you. And that is, my friends, is not an indictment. That is an invitation. Because he has a destiny, a plan, a name, a life for all of you to live that you can only live with the supernatural strength of Christ. And when you are living that life, you are like me. You are running to your prayer closet. You are knocking people over to get there. 
because you know where your strength lies and you know where your joy lies. And I don't want to live a life that I can do without him any longer. I welcome the dependent life. The dependent life is the life that leads to the most joy and the most fulfillment. And it is the key to your dreams, your future, your inheritance. See, God, is, Jesus is preparing his bride. Jesus is preparing his bride. God wants a family. He wants you to know who you are in that family. If he has called you, it is because you have a place in the family that only you can feel. No one else can do your calling for you. He is inviting you in to something so great and something so marvelous because he loves you so much. He goes out to meet Esau. He goes out to, to face his fiercest competition and God lets him go the weakest he's ever been. Why? Because Jacob needed to learn how to depend on God. That is not how we would go to a fight. We'd want to be strong. God says, no, I'm going to let you go, and I'm going to let you go weak. So Esau comes with his 400 men, by the way. I can only imagine the trepidation. Jacob limps out there from this encounter with the Lord. And the Bible tells us that Esau runs to him, runs to him, and they embrace, and they weep. Why? I believe when we take off that mask that we're trying to hide behind, which distorts our view of God, it also distorts our view of others. But when we take it off and just say, you know what, I'm going to be real, it invites other people to do the same. When we are real and we are walking in our identity and when we are broken and when we are vulnerable, the people around us will also become that. It invites them into this safe place that if you can be real about you, then I can be real about me. And the contrary is true. If I get in your presence and you can't be real with me, it makes me feel like I can't be real with you. And God wants us to be real. We pick up each other's vernacular. We become like the people that we hang with. I used to laugh when, when Landon was little, I would talk on the phone to Jill, and I would whisper because I would hold him and he would sleep, and Jill would whisper. And I would tell her, he can't hear you. <laughs> you can talk. But there's something about hearing someone whisper that makes us automatically whisper. And there's something about us being real and tender and spilled out and vulnerable that allows the people around us to be the same way. Because see, Jacob went to meet, he left as Jacob, he came back to meet Esau as Israel. He limped out to that place. Esau could no doubt see there is a difference in my brother. And when Jacob was vulnerable enough to be real, Esau was vulnerable enough to be real. How do I know that? Because it says he wept. You see, when he left, he, he would have said his name was anger, but it wasn't. It was hurt. His real name at that moment was hurt. You stole the blessing from me. And when Jacob approached him and became real with his brother, it invited his brother to be real right back with him. Right back with him. God is calling his children to become real with each other, to become real with him. He has some glorious promises and dreams and plans for every one of you. 
and it is a life that you cannot do without him. The invitation this morning is for you to acknowledge to the Lord, this is who I have been. I'm just going to say it, even if it hurts. This is who I have been. This is what, these are the experiences I've gone through. The invitation is to say, I am no longer that person. As soon as you say it, God will give you your new name. Because your dreams and your inheritance is under your new name. And that is the name that God wants to associate with you. It's like a door that has a name on it, but if you don't recognize that's your name, you don't feel like you can walk through. It's why there are promises in this, the scriptures that are for all of us, but if you talk to one person, they say, yes, they all apply to me, and if you talk to another person, they say, I cannot believe that for myself. Why? Identity. That is the difference. It's not faith. Faith is not the difference. It is identity. Because if God came in and said, beloved, would you turn around and know he was talking to you? I would know he was talking to me. I would know he has said my name. I know it. I know the sound of his voice. I know the name he calls me. But if you don't resonate with that new name, you won't turn around because you won't recognize that name as yours. And God is inviting you. He wants to rename you this morning. If you don't know what he has called you, he will tell you this morning. If you will come down here in honesty, in vulnerability, and say, this is who I see myself, but I don't want to be that person anymore. What is your name for me? He will come and he will tell you. And when you say it, he's going to show you good plans and promises and this life abundant and everything you could ever want or hope for. It's wrapped up in him and it's wrapped up in this new name that he's given you. It is like having just the, the world's wealth stored up in this bank account and you don't think it belongs to you. And it does. It does. It just has your new name written on it. Because you are beloved and you are accepted and you are welcomed and you are invited. And he loves you so much. He loves you. Will everyone stand?